from years ago. We made a fit with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new. It is fitting that at this solemn moment we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people and to the still larger cause of humanity. Hello everyone and welcome to India Colonized, a podcast dedicated to South Asia's modern and contemporary history. I am your co-host Hrithika Chauhan and you are listening to Guftagu a special series where we discuss and engage with varied authors and scholars of South Asian history. In this episode of Guptagu, we have with us Dr. Arvind Sharma, author of the book The Ruler's Gaze, a study of British rule over India from a Sedian perspective. Dr. Arvind Sharma is a long-standing professor of comparative religion at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and the author and editor of numerous books on world religions. He has also formerly served in the Indian administrative services. In this book, Arvind Sharma examines Edward Said's fundamental concept of Orientalism in order to throw fresh light on Indian colonial history through a Sadian lens. The ruler's gaze is an in-depth exploration of how misinformation and misinterpretation influenced how the Greeks and Europeans viewed the narrative of India. To justify their own anomalous presence, the British drew a portrait of India purely based on deep-rooted caste configurations and well-entrenched social practices like sati, child marriage, dowry, and untouchability. This helped them score brownie points for enforcing their governance on the natives. Dr. Sharma extends this into a nuanced understanding of the outside-insider dichotomy of understanding the natives in order to present how this perspective would help to know us as natives better. He picks up the core idea of how the outsiders saw and understood the natives as they deemed fit and far from the objective. And as a result, in George Orwell's words, they denied and obliterated people's understanding of their own history. It is indeed intriguing that Indian civilization, its languages, epics and culture have been a subject of intense inquiry through most of recorded history, but the related influences with which it might have been excavated is still a matter of critical study. This interview explores and examines such a provided stances in the book along with other broader perspectives on how we view Indian history today. Here's the conversation with Dr. Arvind Sharma. Welcome, Dr. Arvind, to our podcast, India Colonized, and the series Guftagu. Um, before we can start the conversation, a couple of biographical questions that we have usually um, to our authors is, if you could tell our audience about uh, you know, your intellectual journey, how you started, and what brought you into religious studies and um how has your journey been? The people who've inspired you, the books that have inspired you? Well, I started out in India. I had my early education in Delhi. I did my BA from the University of Allahabad. And then I became a civil servant in India. I joined the Indian Administrative Service and served in Gujarat for six years. And uh, then I resumed my academic career. Uh, by joining a doctoral program at Syracuse, Syracuse University in economics. While doing economics, I became interested in the role of non-economic factors in economic development. And while invest- investigating those factors, I became interested in the role of religion in economic development. And then my interest, the center of my intellectual interest uh, shifted to religion itself. And I did a master's in theological studies at the Harvard Divinity School, and then got a PhD in from Sanskrit and Indian studies 
Uh, my area of specialization was Hinduism. And my doctoral work was on the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, then I got my first job offer from Australia. So I taught for 10 years in Australia at the University of Queensland, and then at the University of Sydney. And I think 1987, I joined McGill University in Montreal, and I have been here since, over 30 years. Well, that's wonderful. It must be a lot of fond memories across the world. Um, yes. So what caused you, if I may ask, your shift from concentrating in economics? You're doing your master's in economics, and now your interest began to shift to religious studies. Um, what particularly caused your uh, interest to peak into religious studies? Well, you know, India, because I was interested in India's prosperity. And I became convinced gradually that whether economic development occurs or not is the result of something which happens outside economics, strictly speaking. There's a saying in Germany, uh, that meat will be present in the kitchen is never decided in the kitchen. Hmm. That the outside factors are really the decisive factors. And because Indian identity has been so closely tied with religious identity, that's what prompted me basically to shift. And then when I went into comparative religion, I was just so excited intellectually by this field. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it is a very exciting and a moving field. Um, so coming to this particular project, Ruler's Gaze, um, putting Saidian's perspective uh, on the uh, power structures between knowledge and, and, and power to uh, putting that thesis, Said's thesis in India. What, what piqued your interest in that? What caused you to have a Saidian perspective and try and apply that and see if it works to India? Okay, thanks for that question, yeah. So what really happened was that I was asked by a journal to write a review article on Said's work and, the, and subsequent work, works in the genre in our field. And that is when I first got to read him cover to cover because you know you should read the book you are going to review. <laughs> so then I realized that he's making a very interesting contention uh, that the claim to objective knowledge which we make in general, but he's more particular about it, the claim to objective knowledge which the West makes about the non-West, cannot be taken at its face value. Because power and knowledge are closely related. Knowledge is power, but power is also knowledge, as it were. So that epistemologically, the relationship has already become contaminated by power, if it is a relationship between the ruler and the root. So this is his most general, I think it goes back to Nietzsche and others, right? this relationship of power and knowledge. This is a very general thesis. But I think Said's thesis, as I see it, is more specific. He says that because of this relationship, the Orient which the West has constructed is of its own making. And it has very little to do with the so-called objective reality of the Orient. While reading about him, I came across the critique by more than one scholar that, the, that India might present an even stronger case for its thesis than the Orient. And this intrigued me, of course. But in my book, I do not explore the more specific thesis of Said. 
that the West has constructed its own India with which it interacts. I think it's a very, uh, very uh, alluring thesis and somebody should really write on it. But what I was intrigued by was the relationship between power and knowledge. And so I drew up a list of a couple of things which should hold if his thesis is right about the relationship of knowledge and power between the ruler rule relationship in India for instance if uh, what is now being called middle eastern colonialism or imperialism to distinguish from european imperialism in india if the ruler rule relationship held for the muslim period also in india and for the british period also in india then there should be some commonalities. There should also be differences because Islam and Christianity are different, or the West is different from the Middle East. So this is what I tried to explore in the book. So it, I drew up a list of, I think, six points, and each chapter is devoted to an examination of the kind yes. of points. So you bring about uh, around six hypotheses as to how um, you know, your six chapters cover six different hypotheses testing the soundness of Said's thesis and how it could apply uh, to India. So with with maybe if time allows, we will try to go through. Um, we will briefly try touching upon uh, all of them. Um, so, you know, could you like briefly, um, for the sake of audience, simplify the argument of your book or the thematics of your book? and tell what your book exactly is talking about, or what your book is attempting to do. Well, uh, it, it has it had two objectives. To determine the extent to which the this thesis of power and knowledge holds in this case, in the case of British perception of India. Let us call it the British intellectual perception of India. And to what extent it does not. That's that's basically what I've attempted. Well, oh yeah. So yeah. So for instance, if the thesis of the close relationship between knowledge and power is is correct, then those phases of British rule over India, mm -hmm. when they were not in full control of India. Mm -hmm. will have a different orientation in their writings about India at the time than when they had full control. That is from 1818 onwards, sort of. So you, and then, you... Yeah. And then when they start losing control over India, say around 1935 or so, then what they are, especially in the 40s, then what they are writing about India should again reflect that power reality. Yeah. Uh, so you do that in, in your first uh, two sets of chapters where you talk about um, the synchronic and uh, diachronic viewpoints, looking at it from different viewpoints as to, um, you know, with various phases of British rule, how these uh, the the relation between power and knowledge uh, basically varies. So, you know, does the British perception of India change um, with the various stages of power? And if it does, how so? Well, there's a very glaring example of this. If you find, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at what happens after 1818. It's truly remarkable. 1818 is the year in which the British finally defeated the Marathas. Okay, let me back up a bit. There's a common perception that British rule follows Muslim rule over India. What is often not realized is that there is a Maratha period which intervenes between the Mughal and the British. 
the Marathas were the real power from whom the British wrested control of India. This happened in 1818. Till 1818, there was a great deal of appreciation of so, quote unquote native culture on the part of British administrators and scholars in India. After 1818, you get a devastating critique of what they were now called Orientalism, meaning the admiration of the Orient at the hands of James Mill in his history of British India. That voluminous work is basically a critique of all pro-Hindu writings of pre-1818 period. Mm -hmm. The power relationship has changed, the nature of the writing changes. And then when the independence movement gets going, then you again find more appreciative references mm -hmm. to Indian culture. Fascinating. So, you know, talking about the synchronic view, well, well in, in your next chapter, you're testing Saeed's thesis. Um, the idea of us versus them that Said talks about. Uh, so is that an apparent understanding of us versus them when it comes to the context of British um, and Indians? Between, is, is there this dichotomic view that the Britishers are holding? This is us and the... Yes, now, the, the, great, uh, the great point of interest for me here was how race was injected into the situation in India. And so then in several ways. First of all, you have the Aryan invasion theory. It's not there till the 1840s. And then you have this whole theory, which is the foundation of Western ideology, that the Aryans came from outside. A white race enters the dark continent, as it were, and brings light. And then the next step, that the lowest caste in India are racially different from the higher caste. Mm -hmm. You don't find support for this in Sanskritism. Yeah. It's a very important point to realize that the evidence for the Aryan invasion theory is not literary. I would like to emphasize this. It is not literary. It does not come from the Vedas saying that we come from another place. Just as the Parsis in India might say that we come from Iran. Yeah? Or the Europeans might say that we come from you know, Europe. It is a linguistic theory that because these languages are related, the European and the Indian. The original speakers of these languages, what is called Proto-Indo-European, must have lived together. Mm -hmm. And so they try to determine where they live together. And because they determined this to be outside India, therefore you have to have the Aryan invasion to explain the presence of these people in India. So you have first this theory, basically based on race, then you have the racialization of the caste system. I think this is a primary example of yeah, how... So, uh, if, if you could elaborate a little on the um, you know, racialization of the caste system, of how, especially what is, what is uh, one of the most intriguing aspects of colonial rule in India as to how the dynamics of caste was changed, was at least being shaped by these colonizers by the where the relationship uh, the colonizers had to Indian society. Yeah, at, at least in three major ways this happened. I mean, this happened in three major ways. Now, mm -hmm. The first was that caste has been an element mm -hmm. yeah, in Indian identity. Okay. That is not being doubted. Just as you cannot doubt that the European population of America all Americans have a certain 
point of origin Europe. outside america europe or africa yeah. you know yeah yeah and let's take europe yeah so all the people who have come, all 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 americans all white americans belong to some christian denomination right yeah this this is a, this is universal this is not just general this is universal does it make that identity a crucial factor in american self identity if you wanted to manipulate things you can see how you can make that a major element in your identity by the policies you follow the fact that everybody had a caste identity in india does not mean that they were casteist mm -hmm. the fact that every american has a christian denominational identity does not mean that they were or are denominationalists but you can see how this can be done if you want to move in that direction so as western scholars have pointed out now modern scholars who do not feel the need to justify casteism yeah. as a basis for ruling over india have openly stated that caste is one i i one element in their identity others being territorial groups yeah uh the sex to which you belong the agricultural and industrial organizations mm -hmm. little kingdoms royal retinues there's so many other linear segments there are at least ten other lines along which a, a, an average indian in pre british period would identify one social identity being spread over one effect of the british maneuver was to grip primacy to caste and actually not only to just make it the main identity but the one the sole identity yeah so that this was one way in which the caste was used felt the influence of power knowledge felt the influence of power uh, the the second was that they introduced race into the origin of the caste system because their theory as it evolved was that just as the south of the europeans came to south africa and established apartheid to protect themselves from the native people mm -hmm. socially and professionally this is what the aryans did when they came to india so this is how they provided a racial foundation now you can see the effect of that within living memory not only living memory recent memory i myself was mallikarjun khadge of the congress tell the prime minister of india you are an outsider we are the true indians how could he say that because he identifies himself as a member of the lower caste who are the native inhabitants of india and he identifies the prime minister as a member of the higher caste which is mistaken identity case of mistaken identity but anyway so you can see the effect of that should i go on or i have said enough no 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 <laughs> i i no i i just wanted to get to the third part of the argument you were saying that yeah, three okay. parts of it so it was yeah yeah and the third is that if you look at the history of the caste system in india you find that these sanskrit texts early on talk mainly of varna mm -hmm. and the varna are basically four brahman kshatriya vaishya and shudra yeah then after a certain point they talk about jati now jati is what is 
what is called caste proper. That is, castes are, are supposed to be endogamous. You marry among themselves, they marry among themselves. They are supposed to be commensal. They eat among themselves. They define the social circle. And they are supposed to be craft exclusive. Okay. Now, one basic issue in the history of caste has been, how do you relate these two groups? Varnas and Jatis. Now, the Indian explanation for that was, Indian meaning the Indic explanation for that was, at least found in Sanskrit texts, that the Varnas married among themselves. And through that intermarriage, these Jatis were produced. Varnas are always for Jatis estimates vary from 2,000 to 8,000. And the hierarchy among them is vague, sort of undefined. Mm -hmm. The hierarchy among the four Varnas is very clear. Brahman first, then Kshatriya, then Vaishya, then Shudra. We might digress momentarily to ask the question, what is it based on? What is this hierarchy based on? Yeah. But let us begin by examining what it is not based on. Is it based on power? No, because yeah. then the Kshatriya would be on top. Is it based on wealth? No, because then the Vaishya would be on top. Okay. It is not based on service, because then the Shudra would be on top. And what is it based on? Knowledge. Moral and ritual purity. And right. Mm -hmm. The importance of this is, this point is, that when we talk of hierarchy in the West, mm -hmm. we immediately associate power and wealth with hierarchy. And then we tend to transfer it blindly from that on the Brahmanas. <laughs> But that is not the basis of their eminence. Or yeah. the eminence accorded to them in this scheme. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So to come back to the main point, the point to emphasize here is that the digression is over now. So the point to emphasize is that the hierarchy exists. It's there. And it is that, that order is more or less maintained. It's questioned various times and all, but it's the basic one. So what the British did in the third period is they introduced a system of hierarchy among the jatis. And they encouraged the jati, they allotted certain slots to the jatis who is above whom. And there were astronomically large number of cases filed by the various jatis. No, no, we are above this or above that. So I see these three main ways in which the caste system was sort of turned around under the British. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I First, think, yeah. the primary identity marker, if not the soul, then it was racialized. And then the third was that they introduced the, they, they changed the relationship between Varna and Jati by forcing the hierarchy of Jati onto, uh, sorry, hierarchy of Varna onto Jati. Yeah. Now the importance of this, this, uh, this transformation is, is brought out by Dr. Ambedkar very well. Dr. Ambedkar points out that if the differences within these groups are race-based, that means they are biological. You can't make a white person black. Right? at least not in one generation. So you can't change them by social action if they are racial or biological. But if they are cultural, you can change them through education. So he placed a lot of importance on this point. I want to emphasize something here a moment. Most people don't realize. He wrote a book 
Dr. Ambedkar, entitled Who Were the Shudras? Something like that. A title similar to that. Actually, I have it in front of me. Who were the Shudras? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. In this book, he challenges the Aryan invasion theory. I want us to reflect on this. Mm -hmm. He is a person who has everything to gain by supporting this theory. He becomes the victim by accepting this theory. All the upper castes become the victimizers. Right? He dedicates this book to Jyoti Bapule, who whom he regards as his guru. Jyoti Bai Phule accepted the Aryan invasion theory and castigated the upper caste on that basis. Mm -hmm. Even then, Ambedkar rejects this theory in a book which he dedicates to him. So this is the importance of the racialization of them. And that is why he always emphasized, Dr. Ambedkar, that the difference between the untouchables, the former untouchables, the Shudras and the rest of the community, the Varnas, the Savarnas and the Avarnas, can be totally eliminated through what we now call, somewhat crudely, social engineering. Yeah. And this is a very important point to keep in mind, coming as it does from, you know, person like yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, what, even one of the hypotheses that you test in your book was um, the attempts of the British rule to justify themselves being in India, their rule in India. So if you could, you know, elaborate over what were the methods that they, uh, you know, what were the methods that they were employing in order to justify their role in India? How were they justifying this as a mission in India? And how did that, did it phase over their um, rule in India, over the phases of their rule in India, or did it not? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we get it's a kind of mixed motives here. One element is Christianity. The other element is capitalism. Mm -hmm. And the third element is civilization. What do I mean by that? I will take up capitalism first, because that was the first. Mm -hmm. That is to profit from the country. I mean, why was the East India Company established on the last day of 1600, right? Profit. To mm -hmm. trade with India, profit. The whole goal of the presence of the East India Company in India was to maximize its profits. We lose sight of this often and the implications of this. I'll share with you just two implications yeah, to highlight the importance yes. of this. Okay. First, Sati. <laughs> what do you think was the average age of the Sati? when she committed it. Any guess? Um, I don't know, 20 years? Yeah, very good. Yeah, young person, right? Maybe 20s, 25, 20s, 30s, yeah. between very 30s good. and 30s, yeah. Right, yeah. The average age was above 40. Mm. Why would a woman want to commit sati at the age of 40? She has sons. She has already outlived the husband by several years. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what I'm going to share with you now is something I've not been able to investigate beyond a certain point. But I've investigated it enough to make the suggestion yeah. that many of these satis committed sati at the time they did. Mm -hmm. Because the East India Company, when it moved into an area and took over revenue collection, chopped off all illimaginary allocations, meaning 
allocation made for the welfare of poor people, widows, pious apps, and so on. Why? They have to maximize the profit. These widows were protesting this in the form of committing sati. This self-immolation was a form of cultural protest, which was yeah. incomprehensible to the British, mm -hmm. who only saw it as an evil custom. Interesting. The work, the work of Indrani Chatterjee is very interesting in respect of the financial dimension. Mm -hmm. This is one example. Second is, you hear this common complaint, not any, not that much now, but at one time, that Hinduism does not have a social conscience. Okay. Why? Temples don't do anything. You know? mm -hmm. Well, they used to do everything. Until the British to, came along. Until the British came along and wanted to maximize the profit. Okay. Mm -hmm. When they took over the temples. Okay, so this is capitalism. Okay, now Christianity. Right from the beginning, they were, after all, the capitalists were Christians. They also had this idea of introducing Christianity in India. Yeah. In the beginning, early phases of the British rule, the capitalist motive prevailed over the Christian. The company thought that by letting in missionaries, they might disturb social harmony, which may interfere with business. So till 1813, they would not allow missionaries in India in their areas. Okay. Thereafter they did. Mm -hmm. The effort to convert India from 1813 to 1857 is often glossed over in especially British accounts of British rule over India. Because it ended in the mutiny. Or it was at least a contributing factor. But it was a major motive. Mm. Has been a major motive throughout. When they felt secure enough to be able to proselytize, they did. When they felt that this proselytization may jeopardize, jeopardize mm -hmm. their very presence in India, then they toned it down. Not many people know that one of the motives behind introducing English as the medium of instruction was to convert India to Christianity. Lord Macaulay is quite specific about it in his letters to his father, which I cited in the book. So capitalism, Christianity, and civilization. Western civilization forced ahead over the rest of the world from 16th century onwards. And no one can dispute even now that it is the most advanced material culture in the world. And they also, along with that, evolved certain political and social arrangements which they invested with superiority because of their military victories for the rest of the world. And they wanted to introduce these institutions into the area they conquered, which they politically called the white man's burden. So they wanted to civilize India. So they wanted to exploit India, they wanted to Christianize India, and they wanted to civilize India. 
So in the last part of your book, um, you compare the relationship of British and Indian um, and give it a comparison first against the Greeks who did not have this um, the role of being rulers in India, um, comparing how the Greeks perceived India versus how the British perceived India. So tell us a bit about that, the kind of differences that you were able to see, what was something that was starkingly um, visible in, in these differences. The well, most striking feature for me was that for the Greeks, the most remarkable feature of Indian society was its egalitarianism. Mm -hmm. And for the West, it's inegalitarianism. When the Greeks came to India, apparently the caste system was not what it became later. And because India did not have slavery of the type they had in Greece, mm -hmm. they were amazed. Megasthenes is very specific about it. It's such a striking contrast. In that world, the West, that is the Greece, is the inegalitarian party. And India is the egalitarian party. In the modern context, India is the inegalitarian party. The West is the egalitarian party. It's truly astonishing. Yes, yes. So, uh, you again in, in the second part and uh, the final part of the book, you talk about to test if knowledge is in fact driven by power. You, trust, you, you test this in comparison to um, the, the rule of Muslims versus the rule of Britishers in India. And you do this on multiple bases, that is how they view language and religion and culture and social structures and institutions. Um, was there a similarity in, in the way they viewed these things, or were there differences? Well, there was a great similarity that both sides basically had a civilizing role in their self-perception mm -hmm. towards the India. I think in the case of Islam, it has to do with the Jahiliya model, you know, mm -hmm. that the pre-Islamic period of Arabia, Arabian mm -hmm. history, is the period of darkness, and Islam is the light. And so they viewed the pre-Islamic India, religions of India, in the same light. Mm -hmm. And in the modern West, that takes us, in relation to the modern West, there's a slight difference. Uh, there is that religious element of uh, uh, heathen and Christian, yeah? and Christianity being the light. But there is also the element of civilization. Yeah. To a much greater extent. Well, let me, let me elaborate the second point further. The West also has its own version of the Jahiliya, the pre-Islamic and the post-Islamic world, the pre-scientific and the post-scientific. This yeah. is the secular version of it. Yeah? Yeah. And they placed India also in the pre-scientific along with pre-Christian to a much greater extent than the Muslim intellectuals. El Biruni is very interesting on this point. Yeah. He, he introduces elements of civilization mm -hmm. in his Kitab ul Yeah. So, 
in 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 perspective to in in conclusion the kind of similarities that we are able to draw from different viewpoints seeing um seeing this relationship between the ruler and the ruled in different spaces over the phase phases part of time and their relationship with um especially in context to india how far do you believe that uh, said's thesis as and i think you also talk about this in, tr- in the introduction that india would have been a much better um uh example to assert his thesis is it so is is, is india a better example to show the power relation between knowledge and power than yeah. the middle east no on that point i have to uh, take a pass in a sense because mm-hmm. i do not know enough about the uh, western cons- construction of islam or the yeah. middle east to make a honest comparison mm-hmm. i should have a knowledge of what they did in the islamic world yeah. on the same level yeah yeah and maybe that is one of the reasons i stayed away from that you know yeah. in my book yeah but so, india does provide a very good example yeah. of this thesis. yeah but so, only one but i want to alert you to something yeah sorry i want to alert you to something i have not compared or examined saidian orientalism on this point the following point how do we compare the western construction of the islamic world in its own image with the western construction of the indian world in its own image meaning the western image yeah what i have examined is this more general thesis of knowledge and power and that to my mind stands vindicated with the limitations to which i have drawn attention in my last chapter so what according to you were the limitations in in this in this comparison yeah let me uh, illustrate that graphically okay i was quite surprised that in his book in his famous book in his almost revolutionary book why said is discussing western scholarship in relationship to islam yeah he does not mention one particular name can you guess what that who, who that person is no wilfred cantwell smith okay wilfred cantwell smith is the most prominent certainly canadian and certainly one of the most prominent western scholars of the islamic world mm-hmm. he was in india around the time of partition mm-hmm. he taught in lahore he knew maulana aza he knew pandit nehru yeah mm-hmm. he established the institute of islamic studies at magdal he was but he was the previous occupant of the chair i am holding now in other words he is a celebrated islamicist but he is no way mentioned in said's book why and that shows the limitation of said in orientalism because although he is a western orientalist he always advocated that what an outsider to the tradition writes about another tradition should be recognized by the person within the tradition so you're saying that he could not have been an exception 
to what Saeed was trying to emphasize, or maybe that um, you know, with with Smith, it it could have possibly been that you know he he might have either been an exception or maybe Saeed's idea that you should keep the background of the person who's writing in mind while you're assessing a person's work um, would also have kept Smith's. Smith's background in mind while assessing his work, but just a part of the idea that while criticizing his work, just be aware of where it is coming from. So we can have two perspective on, perspectives on this. From the point mm -hmm. of view of Said, you can say he is the exception which proves the rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Western and Orientalists of Islam should have been like Smith, right. but they were not. And yeah. he's perhaps the sole exception, right? Mm -hmm. So he is the exception which proves the rule, which he's trying to establish. Mm -hmm. And my perspective now that you asked me about the limitations is that this also constitutes a limitation of. Yeah. Fair enough. Yes. That it is possible for scholars to engage in genuine intercultural dialogue. Yes, that's that's a fair enough point. So um, this this was an absolutely wonderful conversation. Uh, before we can conclude the conversation, a couple of questions. Uh, the the relevance of this work, the relevance of looking at the relationship of the ruler and the rule in India, Indian perspective, through Saeedian's idea of Orientalism. What do you think is the relevance of of your work in trying to understand? the relationship between the British and Indians. OK. So for me, uh, its chief importance lies in the fact that because the intellectual life of Southeast Asia now, I'm sorry, not South, South Asia. Asia. South Asia, yeah. The intellectual life of South Asia is so dominated by the West yeah. that we have become inured, so to say, to the depiction of South Asian reality in terms of Western categories, yeah. without realizing the distorting effect the media might have for the message. That is to say, to develop an authentic perception, I as an Indian, in order to develop an authentic perception of my own tradition, must free my perception of my own tradition, especially when it is being made through English, from those elements in it, mm -hmm. which because of the linguistic exigency <laughs> creep in and conceptually distort my own perception of my own tradition. Mm. So I'll give you a simple example. The Indian constitution hardly ever refers to religion by the word dharma. The Indian constitution is originally drafted in English. Huh? Yes. So it uses the word religion for the reality to which we refer to as dharma. Now, can we use the word dharma? I beg your pardon. Can we use the word religion to translate dharma uncritically? No. Dharma nirpekshita, the word often used for secularism in India, mm -hmm. yeah? in Hindi and Sanskrit, would mean a person who is immoral. But we use it because we know that we are really what we are meaning is religion in the Western sense. Yeah. 
but this is corrupting the meaning of the word dharma this is a glaring example i have written several pieces on that yeah so well this is a very good example caste definitely yeah hindus don't you know, in modern modern diction of course we use the word caste but it is not a hindu word hinduism is not a hindu word caste is not a hindu word the hindu itself is probably not a hindu word no yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> But see yeah. how the situation changes when you use the word varna and jati. Hmm. Often uh, used interchangeably. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, coming to the end of this conversation, it, it was delightful, and I wish we could engage a uh, little more. But I also hope that, uh, given the opportunity, I would like to engage more on your other works as well, um, with the increasing purview of our podcast. uh it was really delightful and engaging to talk to you um so you know f- f- for our audience who are curious um people who want to study religious studies or indic studies what would you suggest students who start because these as far as i know are not active um academic modules or options especially in say state universities in india um there may be jain studies i have seen departments of jain studies gandhian studies uh i've never really come across a department especially at least our in university of mysore i don't think there is a department of indic studies or maybe there has been one lately but it is not something religious studies that is um looked quite in depth in india uh and i believe that there is growing interest among people to try and understand academically these spaces so people youngsters or people who are interested in getting into the field of religious studies indic studies what would your suggestions be for them where do you want them to look what do you think they can do to get started in the field this is a very large question one but in fact uh, in my own largely ineffective way i have been uh, holding a brief for introducing the study of comparative religion mm-hmm. in india for the past several years i have approached various governments with this request and many have expressed sympathy for the cause and more than sympathy is relevance so we are under this illusion in india that if you keep away from religion the very study of religion you will be able to avoid all conflict based on religion but this is not true nobody draws a blank when you mention a name religion to somebody if i take the name of hinduism to you some image will form in your mind if i take the word use the word christianity or taoism you won't draw a blank you will have some ideas about it and they will be uneducated ideas if you do not have the study of religion as an mm-hmm. academic discipline yeah mm-hmm. in your country so i would urge these people to do whatever they can to promote the inclusion of the study of world religions in our curriculum in india i can recommend a book for the study of world religions uh which i can recommend without hesitation and that is a book called the world religions by houston smith and for those who are interested in indic religions i can recommend the names of certain scholars like no. uh, yeah like sarve palli radha krishna one might want to begin with his hindu view of life mhm uh works by uh tmp mahadevan mhm outlines of hinduism okay several works by gc pande mhm cultural historian from india major figure in the field 
they would yeah. be good starting points yeah that these are wonderful recommendation i'm sure our audience would be interested and i'll be sure to put them in the description as well um so this this was a wonderful conversation uh, doctor and thank you so much for joining and i hope uh, i get to see you again in our engagements with your future works or in, in your luminous past works as well if uh, given the opportunity but thank you so much for engaging with us in coming to india colonies mm-hmm. yeah, it was a wonderful you're welcome, conversation yeah. yeah you're welcome and thank thanks you. for uh, having me on your show thank you Thank you everyone for tuning into this conversation. We really hope you enjoyed this and if you did, please consider subscribing to our channel and podcast for more such amazing content. There is a series of such amazingly curated interactions with authors and scholars on the history of the subcontinent. Check out our website www.indiacolonized.com for more blogs and podcasts exploring the tales of India's contemporary history. Do follow us on our social media sites for more exciting updates. Until next time, stay safe and stay curious.